I had this timeline from Metzger. Basically, I took uh, every date that he has in the uh, this section, this reading of the book that talks about the New Testament backgrounds. I divided it according to how he does, and uh, these are the dates that you're going to need to know for the midterm. Um, and I'm presenting them to you a couple of different ways. You know, I have this timeline, and I have uh, the other, the uh, Christian writings timeline, and also uh, a separate time by other uh, PhD. So I thought this would be interesting uh, to lay it out like this. Uh, in 586 BC, you may know that Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And I believe it was Nebuchadnezzar who was king um, whenever we have the story of Daniel in the lion's den. There's always uh, Jewish stories of hope whenever they are oppressed, and uh, Christian stories too. But this is something that characterize, characterizes uh, Jewish literature. Um, and then in 537 BC, not too long after this, the Hebrews return and try to rebuild the temple. And uh, they go back because of the edict of Cyrus the Great, who basically let everybody go that um, Nebuchadnezzar had brought in, um, and he, he let everybody go back home. So uh, King Cyrus did that. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, and then you need to know, uh, look, out, look at this big gap of history, though, 537 B.C. all the way to 334. You need to know that Alexander the Great is on the scene, and he defeats the Persians and the Syrians. Um, these links here are to Wikipedia because Wikipedia can give you a basic knowledge of these people and uh, events. A lot of people don't like Wikipedia for that, but uh, it's getting pretty good. Most of the articles are written by PhDs or PhD students and also you know people who are passionate about the various topics. I did go I attended a lecture one time where, uh, the student is a PhD student cited only Wikipedia articles and I thought she was going to die but uh, the, the articles were written by professionals in the field and then we have uh, 320 Palestine is annexed into Egypt by Ptolemy um, I believe in the first lecture uh, we talked about Ptolemy and Seleucid who's in the next entry here uh, Palestine is between Syria and Egypt. So the, the Ptolemies controlled Egypt and the Seleucids controlled Syria. And both of them had their hand in the cookie jar in Palestine because of where it's geographically located. And both of them were generals of Alexander the Great who were successful in the wars that followed his death because, of course, he left no heir. And uh, if you have questions about Alexander the Great, you can see the movie. Colin Farrell is a uh, very convincing Alexander the Great. And in uh, 198 BC, the, there's a uh, resistance against the Hellenization of the Seleucids. Now, whenever the Ptolemies were in control of Palestine, they had a very light hand, and they let Israel pretty much rule over itself. But when the Seleucids took over, they had a different idea of Hellenization, and that is spreading Greek culture to the lands that they controlled. And so there was, there were some, there was some resistance. The Hasidians in the um, second century BC, they resisted Hellenization and they held to Hebrew customs. And it's from these folks that the rebellions, the early rebellions uh, came to fruition. 
Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes IV became the ruler of the Seleucids in 175 BC. He's important for several reasons. Uh, he sparks a rebellion by requiring a priest to sacrifice a pig on the high altar in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And of course, you know that Jews cannot eat pork and pigs are unclean and it was the abomination of desolation whenever it did occur. But he, re he asked the high priest, whose name was Mattathias, to sacrifice a pig on the high altar. And not only did he refuse, but he killed the man who offered to do it. And he killed the uh, deputy of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was trying to enforce uh, this edict. So begins the Maccabean Revolt. So Antiochus sends the representative to order the priest Mattathias to sacrifice a pig on the high altar. He refuses, kills the Jew that does so, and the government official. He then goes up and down the countryside with his sons, upsetting pa pagan altars, forcibly circumcising boys, and otherwise enforcing Hebrew customs with uh, some brutality. You know, you might remember Antiochus Epiphanes, um, he would kill babies who were circumcised and hang them around their mother's necks, and he would um, kill you if you had a Torah in your possession. And, you know, he's just really extreme trying to wipe off uh, wipe Judaism off the face of the earth, or at least the face of Palestine. And Mattathias has had enough, and he leads his sons into war. Um, Mattathias names his third son, Judas Maccabees. He is the hammerer as his successor, and then he dies, 166. And Judas leads a successful guerrilla campaign that eventually ends with the dedication of the temple. In 165, Antiochus Epiphanes IV dies, fighting the Parthians, and I believe that's an, an error here. You just need to know that he died in 165, and a Syrian general compromises with Judas, and that compromise uh, turns out to uh, caused the uh, rededication of the temple and the origin of the Hanukkah celebration. Well, Judas dies about four years later, and uh, he decided he was going to lead a war of con conquest instead of revolt. So he tries to expand the Palestinian uh, territories. He's finally killed by uh, Trypho, a Syrian general. And I believe that that story is one of deception. You know, the Syrian general uh, stabs him in the back somehow. And the last brother, last living brother, Simon, takes control in 142. So, in 142, Demetrius II, king of Syria, gives independence to Palestine. Now, this freedom for Palestine only lasted 86 years and it was the last time Palestine was independent until 1947. And hopefully that might give you some context as to why they are so passionate about remaining there and remaining free. In 134 BC, Simon is murdered by... Simon and his sons are murdered by a son-in-law of Ptolemy and is the only son who escaped was John Hyrcanus. And John Hyrcanus becomes a famous warrior. Uh, he is a worthy grandson of Matthias, and he began the conquest of the land east of the Jordan. Now, this is something that's extremely important whenever we get to the time of Jesus, because Idumeans had to accept Judaism and they were basically Gentiles. 
and they're east of the Jordan. So whenever John Hyrcanus conquers that area, he forces them to convert to Judaism. And he also forced conversion on the Sumerians and on the Galileans, who were also mostly Gentile. So whenever Herod the Great comes on the scene, he is an Edomian. And his great-grandfather, or maybe even his grandfather, uh, would have known about this firsthand, and he grew up resenting the Jews. Well, John Hyrcanus dies, and Aristobulus takes over as king in 104. And then in, we skip to Roman rule, which began in 63 BC. Uh, Pompey, you remember, uh, he is one of the senators who was around whenever everything was going down with uh, Julius Caesar and Octavian, and Mark Anthony and Octavian had a hand in the Palestine as well. But Pompey negotiates with the Jewish fac factions. He, they, he conquered Jerusalem in force and abolished the Jerusalem throne, annexed Palestine into Rome. And Mark Anthony and Octavius placed Palestine under Herod the Great and Idumean. Well, say it again, an Idumean warlord. And in 37 BC, Herod the Great captures Jerusalem. He's a very unsavory character. He's the one uh, Julius Caesar said, or Augustus Caesar said that uh, it's better to be a pig in the house of Herod than a wife. So he, he's kind of like uh, Henry VIII, I guess. Um, but he did try to make nice with Jews. Uh, but one thing that the Romans did not like was rebellion and revolt. They wanted people to happily and peacefully give them their taxes. And Herod the Great was a good politician. He was extremely not, he was extremely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He was nervous about losing the throne to the Romans or being deposed. So he built five forts along the uh, coast and he could retreat further and further inside of Palestine to escape a Roman uh, conquest. So he the most the innermost was Masada, where everyone killed themselves later on. Some uh, zealots were held up there. All of Herod's sons are mentioned in the New Testament. There's this guy, Archelaus. He was exiled by the Romans for being too harsh. Uh, like I said. The Romans wanted you to pay your taxes happily, and if you uh, were rebelling, or if your leader was uh, causing you to rebel, the Romans went to uh, the source and cut it off. Whether it be reassigning a leader, killing the leader, or conquering the people again. But uh, they wanted everything to go smoothly, because they wanted, you know, the whole point of war is killing people and taking their stuff. And the Romans wanted you to be alive so you could keep on making more stuff for them to take. So uh, they had a pretty ingenious way of setting up their empire that eventually failed. And then Philip, he built the majestic Caesarea Philippi. And let me tell you, that was something else back in the day. Um, Jesus went out there once. Matthew uh, 16, 13, and Herod Antipas. He was, he was a guy that was criticized by John the Baptist in Mark 14, 1 and 2. And then uh, his role passed on to Herod Agrippa, who was mentioned in Acts. And Agrippa II uh, judged Paul one time in Acts 25. And then in 66 CE, a, an idiot by the name of Gessius Florus, who otherwise would have been unknown to history, demanded 17 talents from the, 
from the temple treasury. And this is entirely symbolic because 17 talents is it's like asking for for a penny from a, a millionaire. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous that he demanded this tiny amount from the temple treasury. And Herod Agrippa even stepped forward and tried to negotiate. But uh, the Jewish, the Jews, of course, refused. You know, that money was holy. And he came with a military contingent to enforce the claim, the claim on the 17 talents. And they, the Jews amassed a considerable force. Uh, they were going to fight to the death in order to uh, not let go of this, these 17 talents. And Nero died. Now this is really interesting. All these Jews come out expecting a fight, expecting to die under the Romans. And all of a sudden, the Romans leave. And the reason why they left is because the Emperor Nero died in 67, and Vespasian had to leave. You know, this is, this is kind of historical irony. You know, they, the Jews come out to fight. The Romans have marched all the way there. Well, they're going to turn around and go back to Rome so Vespasian can take over as emperor. Well, in, so the Jews take this as a sign of God. And there, there's mass uh, religious fervor and uh, thanksgiving to God that they got saved from the Romans and it was God's will. Well, just a few years later, the general Titus arrives, and he sieges Jerusalem for five months. And we actually have, a, I believe, a first-hand account, or at least second-hand account, of Josephus in his wars, books five and six. He actually describes the siege of Jerusalem, and people were starving to death, there was pestilence, um, and maybe even some cannibalism, of course, and people eating horses and leather and eating their shoes. Well, whenever Titus came in, he, Josephus says that he made the streets flow with blood so deep that it could come up to a horse's belly or to a man's chest. And he also says that the Romans tried their swords on the bodies of the dead and the dying. Now, trying the sword means that they're testing the sword to see how sharp it is and to see if they need to sharpen it. And then there's the Ark of Titus in Rome, which is so cool that I'm going to see if I can show it to you real quick. Okay. Send me a text. Bye. Okay, I'll try to edit that out. Okay. Um, that's not the part I wanted to show you. Let's see here. Okay. Now, this is a menorah uh, from inside the temple. You know, there was a temple inside the menorah. Inside the menorah. There was a more menorah inside of the temple. And these are Jews that are enslaved, carrying the inside of the temp the inside, the holy things from inside the temple. They're carrying that to Rome. And uh, they're going to be enslaved, and they're going to build help build the Colosseum. But I will get you a clearer picture of that. I thought it was pretty cool whenever I saw it for the first time. I mean, it's horrible, but it is kind of neat that uh, the destruction of the temple is marked so prominently in history uh, in the Ark of Titus. But uh, let's see. That's what the Ark looks like. And the inside here is where those... Relief swore that we were looking at.
Okay, and then he destroys the temple in 70. And this is a major reason why some New Testament books, like especially the Gospels, are dated sometime. Excuse me, we don't know when they were written, but they were written sometime after 70 CE because that's when the temple was destroyed. And if there's any reference to the temple being destroyed, then people say, well, it must have been written after the fact. But there's always a possibility that Jesus was actually a prophet, and he did predict the future and said, you know, look, we need to repent because the temple will be destroyed. But most people don't uh, believe that it's a prophecy, but that the writers of the gospel are addressing people where they were. In other words, it had happened, so the gospel writer was comforting people by telling them, look, Jesus knew this was going to happen, and he's taking care of us. There were Christians, by the way, in Jerusalem in 70, whenever the temple was destroyed. And then, in 135, Hadrian puts down a rebellion by a crazy guy named Bar Kokhba, and this is also known as the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. He, it means son of the star, and Jerusalem was completely leveled, and all the Jews were forced out, and they were not allowed to return, and they didn't return, actually, until modern times. A pagan temple was b built on the Temple Mount, and Jews were forbidden to enter the city, like I said, and it was renamed, a Roman name, Colonia Aelia Capitolonia. So, I want you to know the dates and the people and the meaning behind it all uh, for the midterm. So I'm introducing it to you now, and uh, I may make another video on this and if uh, there are any questions, if I need to uh, make anything clearer. So thank you very much, and please be sure to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. I'd love to hear from you.